forever of your peace. I love you. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, welcome to Cross Point Community Church. Uh, for those uh, new visitors, we welcome you. The church opens wide her doors for the seekers of truth and lovers of God. And for the regular member and attendees, uh, welcome. Uh, nice to see you as well on this uh, beautiful Sunday. Today's call to worship is taken from Psalm 139, verses one through six. Psalm 139 for the director of music of David, a psalm. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Let us pray. We have come to worship God, who loved us before we were yet born, who knows us even better than we know ourselves, whose presence never leaves us, and whose love for us never ceases. This is our God. Let's worship together. Please welcome our praise leaders, Elder Jeremy and Julie. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, and happy the years of dragon. I hope you are all have your fill of uh, festivals of foods and gathering and fellowship. Let's all stand. Let's worship our God, because who created the heaven and the earth, and worth all our praises. And uh, because of our God's love, then we can gather together uh, in this sanctuary and worship together the love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongues of pain can ever tell. He goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest Oh, 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 oh,
fathers. Broken every chain. The 
your salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then come the morning, the sound the promise, your very body begin to break. Out of the silence, the roaring lion, the dead or grey, has no claim on me. Then come the morning, that sell the promise, your very body begin to chosen by our uh, uh, today's uh, the, uh, uh, the, the newly baptized Ian, but unfortunately uh, he couldn't come today. Uh, so Ian and I go way back. Well, he was actually a helper when I was uh, doing one of the EVS station, mission station, and I'm, I'm so glad that uh, I was able to do something for him today. So his chosen sound is I Surrender. Ian, if you are at YouTube, I hope you are singing along. I surrender. I surrender. 
grace we uh, look up to you because you are our father you love us so much you give us hope and give us a life abundantly and thank you for being our father uh, may we all uh, surrender ourselves and submit to your will help us to become the channel of blessing that you make us to and help us to reach out to the people who are not yet know you and help us to to be strong and glorify your name thank you in Jesus name we pray amen please be seated Uh, thank you, Jeremy and Julie, for leading us in songs of worship. Uh, as we go on, we have a few announcements to bring to your attention. Uh, the first of these is Easter festivity sign up. And what that is, is we're taking this advantage uh, for the third year in a row to reach out to our community during Easter. And so we're holding an event on Saturday, March 30th. And so if you would consider, if you have the time, the ability to help out and assist, there will be many activities. There will be a, a, a Stations of the Cross or a Revolution uh, Redemption Road uh, thing. We're going to have two of them, one for younger people, uh, those for older, uh, Easter egg hunt, etc. So I think it's a really good opportunity to reach out to our local community to let them know uh, the truth, uh, the gospel truth. And so the QR codes there, um, we just asked if you consider in the next week or so, so that we know how many volunteers we have, and then that's going to determine how many activities or various activities we can support on this day, March uh, 30th. Uh, next announcement is uh, baptism classes are happening. So uh, we have been hearing in the past few weeks, people come up here and, and uh, give their testimony. If you feel uh, God tugging at your heart or you want to know more about baptism, please contact uh, Pastor Nathan and the classes are, will be starting up uh, beginning on February 25th. And so you can also contact Elder Charles Wong or Deacon Rick He as well. Uh, 
And finally, the last announcement is uh, there are more, more opportunities to assist and for the younger members of our body. Uh, they're looking for nursery co-workers, Sunday worship leader coordinator for kids ministry, et cetera. So please reach out uh, to the children's ministry if that's, if that's calling to you as well. So at this time, I would like to uh, call out Pastor Nathan Willems. This Sunday, he's preaching on our origin story with two passages from Genesis. Thank you. Uh, please join me in a word of prayer as we get started with the sermon. Father God, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for uh, the celebration of a new year uh, within the lunar calendar. Um, we thank you also, Lord, uh, for the fact that we get to celebrate uh, the new life that we have in Christ um, as we anticipate baptisms. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand uh, who you are and what you've done um, and who we are as a result, as a result of today's sermon. May you be honored and glorified. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Everything has an origin story. I don't know if you realize that, but, well, I would say almost everything. Um, if you know anything about superheroes or comic books or graphic novels, you're familiar with origin stories. If you're a fan of Spider-Man, for example, you know that he has an iconic origin story. And if you have seen um, uh, recent movies like Spider-Man No Way Home, he has at least three origin stories in that one. And if you've seen the animated version, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, he has something like thousands of origin stories in that one. Uh, origin stories matter because they inform who we are and what we're here for. For example, origin stories tend to be told to strengthen national or ethnic identities. You'll hear abbreviated versions of origin stories during political speeches or during debates. You also hear origin stories from political leaders arguing for specific policy or explaining why war was necessary. But just because origin stories uh, lead to justification for evil, such as when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, it does not mean that origin stories themselves are evil. Origin stories inform who we are and what we're here for. Another reality of origin stories uh, is that they help us to shape or determine our worldview. Everyone has a worldview. Everyone does have a worldview. A worldview is a collection of beliefs that determine all your other beliefs. Another way to think of a worldview is that it is uh, a foundation for all your other beliefs. Your worldview beliefs are the foundation for all your other beliefs and your values and then your actions. See, a worldview will answer four basic questions and often more than four, but at least the following four questions. The first question is, where did we come from? The second question is, what's wrong with the world? The third question is, how do we fix What's wrong with the world? How do we fix the problem? And the fourth question is, how am I to respond, or what should I do as a result? And the origin stories that we tell typically answer the first of those four questions. Where did we come from? The reality is that Genesis 1 is our origin story. And when I say our, I don't just mean Cross Point Community or the Chinese Bible Church of Greater Lowell. Genesis 1 is the origin story for all humanity. It's a bold claim, but it's true. Genesis 1 is the origin story for all humanity. It tells us who God is and who we humans are in reference to who God is. It also tells us what we're here for. Now, for many people, when they open the Bible and read Genesis 1, they're coming with the question, how? How? But Genesis 1, while it describes in some detail how God created the world, its primary focus 
is in answering the question, who? Yeah, we still ask how. So let me give you a, a fair warning about Genesis and the origin story here. Okay, if you have an unyielding uh, stance on how creation happened, then you're just being foolish because there's no single theory of how the world was created by God according to Genesis 1 that's without its problems or difficulties. For example, I maintain, full disclosure, I'm showing you my cards, I maintain a 24-hour literal creation, like 24-hour little day period of creation. Each day was 24 hours. That's what I maintain. But this view is not without its logical difficulties and unanswered questions. No view of Genesis 1 is without its difficulties or questions. But this morning we're going to consider how God created the world and everything in it by focusing on who. Specifically, we're going to look at who God is and who we are in light of who God is. We're going to do that by looking at Genesis chapter 1, 1 to 5, and then chapter 1, verse 26 to chapter 2, verse 3. We're looking at these verses, skipping a large section of Genesis 1, simply because we don't have enough time to cover it all. Uh, even though Genesis chapter 1-1 one, one to Genesis chapter 2-3 is basically the introduction to the whole book of Genesis, the introduction to the Bible. It's our origin story. So if you don't have it, please open your Bible. Uh, it's probably not your first page. It's probably some introductory material in your Bible. But you open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. That's where we'll spend our time this morning. Genesis chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 1, 1 to 5, and then jumping to verse 26 and going to chapter 2, verse 3. So please follow along as I read. I'll be reading from the ESV version. This might be familiar to you, but here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Now jump to verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps in the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, you may not have realized this as we were reading through it, Genesis chapter 1, but we're not the first recipients of this book. Moses is the author of Genesis. He wrote Genesis to the people of Israel. Israel. Specifically, he was writing to the people who had only ever known slavery in Egypt. So this nation receives an origin story that tells them who God is, this God who has rescued them from slavery. But it's not like the Israelites were ignorant. You see, they knew the other origin stories of the people around them. They had heard of other creation myths of the people of Egypt and the Babylonians. In those creation myths, there were violent struggles between so-called groups of gods. 
Humans were either an afterthought in those stories made from the blood of the slain God, or they were created by the gods to bring the gods food. One commentator notes that the theological battle of Moses' day centered around the belief in one God who is himself uncreated, merciful, and sovereign versus the belief in multiple gods and demons uh, who are capricious, unpredictable, and often immoral. So Moses, by inspiration of God, wrote Genesis as something of a polemic. Uh, If you don't know what polemic is, you can Google it. It it basically means just like a a piece of writing that goes against a specific group of people or a person. He writes this as a polemic against the other extant creation myths of the time, the other available creation myths of the time. Moses wrote Genesis 1 to tell the people then who God is and who they, the people, are. He wrote so that they, the ancient Israelites, understood, and so that we today understand who God is. So Moses begins Genesis with four words saying, in the beginning, God. By the fourth word, we are introduced to the main character of the Bible. The Bible is all about God. It is not about us, it is about Him. It's for us, it's for our good, but it is about God. And the word of God here, the word for God here in the Hebrew is Elohim. This, as, as one commentator notes, is simply the uh, ordinary word for God. It's plural in form, singular in meaning. And in Genesis 1.1, we are introduced to this God, and we can infer that in the beginning, God, well, he's self-sufficient. He doesn't depend on us. It wasn't like in the beginning, people and then the gods. It was just in the beginning, God, by himself, in the beginning, God. Uh, And also, quick note, I am using gendered language for God. When I say himself, he, God, him, it's because God uses gendered language about himself as a way to accommodate our understanding, but more on this later. You see, we weren't around at the beginning. That's why God speaks to Job and says, where were you when I created the foundation of the world? You weren't here. You don't know what it's like. I do. I was here. I made it. God is self-sufficient, um, but he's also eternal. One commentator writes, before the beginning of time, there was none but that infinite being who inhabits eternity. Because God doesn't have a beginning. God has always been. We have a beginning. God does not. God is eternal. God is also the first cause the unmoved mover, the source and the origin of all life. We know that because we see that God is creative. The word used here for in the beginning God created, that's a word that's always used of divine activity describing something new, fresh, and perfect, better than the video games you're playing presently. See, God the divine being fashioned a new, perfect heavens and earth. The two heavens and earth form a merism, which is a literary term for two things that express totality, the two representing a whole. And we can see that God is powerful. After all, he created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. It wasn't like, in the beginning, God took some stuff that was there and then he created the heavens and the earth. No, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created them from nothing. Friends, you can't do that. I can't do that. We take stuff and we create stuff out of the stuff that exists. God takes nothing and he makes something out of it because God is powerful. So now we look at verses 2 to 5. Not only is God self-sufficient, eternal, powerful, creative being who's the source and origin of all life, but God also brings order out of chaos. We see that in verse 2 when God created the heavens and the earth that he started with a mass that was formless and void. One pastor rightly notes, we aren't told why God chose to start uh, to start his creative work with a chaotic mass that was dark and formless and empty. We're not told why God did that, but we can see from verses 2 to 5 that God works in his creative ways to move from formless to form. God moves from bringing chaos, he moves it into order. 
God makes habitable what is previously uninhabitable, which lines up with what Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's making heaven habitable for us. And we also read in verse 2 that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Matthew Henry rightly points out that the Spirit of God was the first mover. Think about it. What was moving in the beginning? It was God. God was moving. God was the mover hovering over the waters. He explains God is the fountain of life and the spring of motion. Dead matter would be forever dead if God had not quickened it. And, Henry adds, this makes it credible to us that God should raise the dead. Right? It makes sense. If God can move dead matter, God can also raise the dead. Which is pretty important if you maintain Jesus rose from the dead, which I think if you read God's word, you would maintain. We see that God brings order out of chaos, and then seemingly out of nowhere, God speaks. And what God says happens. In verse 3, God says, let there be light. Perhaps you've heard of fiat creation or creation by fiat. Fiat is a Latin term that's, tra- that's translation of the words let there be. Let there be light. It's fiat creation. God spoke and created light. This points to at least two things. First, it points to God's ability. Think about it. God has a powerful word. One commentator notes there's no hint of magic as in the mythological accounts, but in its place is the record of God speaking with effortless, omnipotent, unchallengeable divine word that accomplishes what he commands. It would be really nice to have that kind of word. Don't you think? You just say it and then it happens. That's not how things typically happen as a parent. It's not how things typically happen as a spouse. Hey, do this, and then it just happens. No, but for God, he speaks, and it happens. This kind of power is unknown amongst humanity. None of us can simply speak, and then it happens. We are dependent on outside sources, limited by our understanding, limited in our ability and power. But God is not. God is dependent on no one unlimited in understanding and power. He speaks, and it happens. When God creates light, we can also infer that God didn't create darkness inherently, at least not in the same way, simply by speaking. It's not like, let there be darkness, and let there be light. No, he says, let there be light. Think about it. We understand light to, we understand darkness to be the absence of light, or a surface which absorbs light. Darkness was the state of things before God said, let there be light, and we, if we would have been there, we wouldn't have known what darkness was because there had been no light. We only know darkness because of light. But that's not true for God. God knows darkness and light. And it's not as if darkness was bad, though it's often associated with evil and wickedness in the Bible. In fact, darkness is part of the whole of God's creation that he calls very good at the end of chapter 1. But we can infer from Genesis 1 that when God created light, uh, if you read it, um, you see that, well, he didn't create sun, moon, and stars until day 4. So we can infer that God caused light to shine from a source other than the sun, moon, and stars during the first three days of the earth's existence. Um, After all, God is the one who dwells in unapproachable light. So I'm not sure how that happened. I wasn't there but I do think that God created light even without the sun, the moon, and the stars. In verse 4, we see that God looks on his creation of light and he declares that it is good. God saw what he had made. He saw the light that he had made and said, that's good. The goodness of light was seen in that it was exactly as he designed it. It was able to fulfill the end for which he designed it. It was useful. It was profitable. God takes the light that he creates, and then he separates it from the darkness. But it's not like what you think. When I say separate, you're thinking like oil and water separating. Uh, Instead, when God speaks and God blesses, God actually provides structure. God provides roles. God provides rules. One commentator notes, separated here means not to pull apart. Rather, Uh, separated here 
means to assign each part its perspective, its respective sphere and slot, giving it space. You, you, you are here, and you are here. You're different, you're separate, you're distinct. This assignment of place and purpose is further bolstered by naming. Look at verse 5. God names the light day, and the darkness he names night. These names provide identification and imply roles for each. The day doesn't act as the night, and the night doesn't act as the day. They're separate, they're distinct. They have different roles, different structure. God is creating structure out of chaos. God is providing rules and order. And we see that also when he uses the ordinal number uh, in verse 5. The beginning of the first day. To say that something is first implies that there will be a second, giving further order and structure and time, or order and structure to time and space. And if we were to continue to read through chapters 1, verses 6 to 25, we'd see God producing and providing structures, forms, and then filling them. Forms and structures in days 1 to 3, filling them in days 4 to 6. Now jump with me to verse 26. When we get to 21st, verse 26, we are in day 6. Day 6 of creation. And God speaks and says, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now did you notice that God says, let us? God's not talking about a vegetable, uh, lettuce. Uh, God is talking about let us. Plural. Some see this as a Trinitarian reference. Referring to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, because God, God the Spirit was cl- clearly over the water. And John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God, and, and uh, it was through the Word that all things were created. And while the, the word us here hints at plurality within the Godhead, it would be reading too much into the verse to say that this verse clearly expresses a Trinitarian idea. Um, after all, Moses was writing against... Uh, a plurality of gods in the Old Testament, but uh, it's not impossible, okay? I think there are hints of the Trini- Trinity here in, in verse 26, let us make man in our image. But I think it's more likely that when God says let us, uh, he's kind of taking counsel within himself. It's kind of how when you're working alone, on, on your, when you're like working on a project or something, you say, let's see if this works. You say, let's. Who are you talking about? Let's means let us. And you're the only one present. You you use that kind of taking counsel within yourself. Let's let's work on this. Uh, And I think that God was kind of doing the same thing. Let's, Let's see how this goes. God makes mankind in his likeness and in his image. We'll talk more about this shortly, but for now we can see from verse 27 that the image of God includes being made male and female. God created humanity to be binary and complementary in our sexuality. See, if something is binary, it refers to or relates to things that are composed of or involving two things, often representing a whole, two things. And it shouldn't surprise us that God creates a binary in human sexuality, male and female. There are multiple binaries throughout Genesis 1. There's heaven and earth. There's light and darkness. There's earth and water. There's evening and morning. Humanity was created, male and female, in binary fashion. Contra today's arguments that gender is completely fluid. Humanity was also created to be complementary in our sexuality. The fact that we are made male and female is part of God's good design and plan. This binary and complementary reality is not oppressive. Rather, it is freeing. It means that we don't have to make up the roles that we want to have. We just have to be self-made and self-making. I can be whatever I want. It doesn't work that way. Instead, we can fulfill the roles that God has given us. And we were created to be complementary male and female so we could fulfill the purposes that God has for us. One author explains, each 
uh, each gender, male and female, is maimed apart from the other. Both stand side by side on one level before God. We need each other. And the fact that God made humanity as male and female is also purposeful. For example, look at verse 28. God blesses humanity. It's the first thing he does when he creates humankind. Part of this blessing comes uh, from seeing that we are interdependent, that we display the image of God together. There's no place for misogyny or misandry, which is hatred or violence against women or against men. Instead, knowing that we all come from one man and one woman should give us reason to see that we are all part of the same family which should cause us to value and love other human beings who are also made in God's image. But one clarification is, at this point is necessary. When, when God made humanity as male and female in the image of God, this doesn't mean that God himself has gender. Nor does God have sexual organs or functions. One commentator explains that even though God doesn't have these, they are part of his good, pleasing, and perfect will for his creation. We know this to be the case when we consider his command in verse 28. He tells them, be fruitful and multiply, which is only possible through the unity of husband and wife. More on that next week. So we're in Genesis 2. See, we have seen how God is revealed in Genesis 1-1. We see in verses 2-5 to and verses 26-30 to that he brings order out of chaos. He speaks and it happens. He blesses his creation. He provides good structures, good roles, good rules, including being made male and female. Being made binary and complementary in our humanity. We also see at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 that God is sovereign over creation. God's sovereignty, his rule and his reign and authority can clearly be seen from the fact that he is the creator After all, Matthew Henry explains, if he is creator, then no doubt he is the owner and possessor of heaven and earth. It makes sense, right? If you create something, you are the owner of it. You can determine its use and its function. Similarly, God is the creator of everyone and everything, so he's sovereign over it. Another way to say this is, if all is of him or from him, all must be to him. If all is from him, all must be to him. This is why he can look on the day, on day six, he can look over all what he created and in verse 31 say, it is very good. He knows, he made it. It's fulfilling the purpose that he created for it. His sovereignty also enables him to sanctify the seventh day, which we see in verses, uh, chapter two, verses two and three. The days are his, Creation is his. All that he makes is very good. He can sanctify whatever he wishes because he himself is holy. He can set it apart. He made it. God is sovereign. And if you don't recognize that, you're going to live as if you are sovereign, that you get to determine how things are, and your sovereignty is going to come up right against God's sovereignty. And let me tell you, God is sovereign. You are not. Moses helped the people of Israel then and helps us today to know this incredible God. So what ought we to do with this knowledge of who God is? Well, I would recommend the first thing you should do is accept that God is the sovereign creator and Lord of the whole universe. It starts there. If you don't accept that God is the sovereign creator and Lord of the whole universe, you're going to have major problems with your worldview moving forward. Not only must we accept that God is the sovereign creator and Lord of the whole universe, we must also understand that God still brings order out of chaos. He is the one who created light in the midst of darkness. He is the one who gives hope in the night. He is the one who gives life to lifeless mass. He provides structure and order and calls it good. So too, he can bring order and stability to the chaos of your life. Brothers and sisters, there is no mess too great, no problem too big, no situation too chaotic that God cannot work things out to make them to be very good. 
It's what he does. It's who he is. God still brings order out of chaos. And we can take comfort in the fact that God brings order out of chaos. We can also take comfort in the good structures, roles, and rules that God provides. But we see those rules and structures more clearly as we understand who we are. So we now see who God is, and now we will turn our attention to what God has to say about us from this passage, about who we are. See, just as a man and a woman were made in the image of God, we too are made in the image of God. But before we go on, a brief caveat here. Whole books have been written about the image of God. This morning, with the time we have remaining, I'm going to give you the Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, Cliff Notes version of what it means to be made in the image of God. So we'll keep it simple. Okay, there's two things you need to know about being made in the image of God that we see from this passage. There's more, but we don't have time to go through it today. Okay, the, fact that ma- that the fact that male and female were made in the image of God implies that we have both worth and purpose. Because they and we are made in the image of God, they have worth and we have worth. For the Israelites then, they knew, as one commentator points out, that in both Egyptian and Mesopotamian society, kings and high-ranking officials might be called the image of God. But here in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it's all of mankind who's made in the image of God. Not just some special people, all people. And this this is huge implications. For example, you display the image of God, which means you have worth. I don't know if you caught this in our reading of the passage, but humanity is given a place of honor over all the rest of creation. No other part of God's creation is imbued with God's image. It's only humankind. Being made in the image of God gives us worth. Note with Matthew Henry that man was not made in the likeness of any creature that went before him. Contra evolutionary psychology or evolutionary biology which states that we are just some form of life form evolved from some other life form. We're not made in the image of animals. We are made in the image of God. We are made in the likeness of our Creator. This means that humans have worth and value that other animals and other life forms, like bugs or dogs or horses or dolphins or any other beloved animal that you know, don't have. And that's not a slight to God's good creation. It's not to say that those things are are bad. No, they're still good. It's just a recognition of the worth and the honor that's given to humanity. Moreover, when God became man in the person of Jesus Christ, when Jesus took on human flesh, he showed the worth and value of humanity. When he died in our place, he showed how much he values humanity and that he gave his life for us. So no matter what your anxiety says, you have worth. No matter what your self-defacing tendencies say, you have worth have worth. No matter how difficult life is for you, you have worth. No matter the problems you face in your life that might make you feel like you are worthless. Let me tell you this morning, you are made in the image of God. You have worth. You have God-given, God-affirmed value. You bear His image. Be made in the image of God means that you have worth, but it also means that you have purpose. Look at the opportunities given to our first parents in in verse 26. They are to subdue, to have dominion over creatures of the land or in the air or on the sea. This opportunity to subdue creation or, or having dominion over creation doesn't mean that we can do with it however or whatever we want. Sure, we are to utilize the resources God has given us so we can make them useful for human beings generally, but this is not to be at the expense of the creatures that God has put under our dominion. So instead, we are to care for them. We are to tend them. We are to create opportunities for other living things to flourish. That's what it means for us to be uh, having dominion over. 
is because we're made in the image of God, we are to act as his representatives. When God cares for us, he doesn't just use us and then toss us aside like trash. So too, we're, as we're his representatives, when we use creation, we don't just use it and then toss it aside as if it's worthless. We are to care for it. We are to tend it. We are to act on his behalf to care for it. We are to utilize creation to make good things from it. This doesn't mean we will pillage creation. Instead, it means that being made in the image of God, we act as his representatives to live in, in harmonious relationship, perfectly harmonious relationships. Humanity with other creatures, male and female together, humanity and God. Our first purpose as those who are made in the image of God, is to rule over and care for God's good creation. Do you do that? Do you care about creation? Do you care about the world that God created? Or you're just like, whatever, I don't care. It's, only, it's all going to burn someday, so screw it. It's not the attitude we should have. God, wasn't, God didn't do that when he created it. It's like, oh, this is all going to burn someday, so screw it. No, he put us in charge of it to take care of it. What are you doing to care for creation? That's our first purpose as people made in the image of God. Our second purpose, being made in the image of God, is actually to enjoy God and His good provision. Did you notice the timing of the creation of mankind? Mankind was created last of all God's creation. This encourages us because God had prepared everything for the re- arrival of humanity. And as theologian John Calvin explains, if God has such care for us before we existed, he will by no means leave us destitute of food and other necessities of life now that we are placed in this world. Moreover, since man- mankind is not an afterthought, we're not created to give food to the gods. Instead, mankind is the climax of creation And God provides food for humanity and for all the rest of his creation. We see that in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 1. To eat plants and fruit, which, you might, God made us vegetarians to begin with. That means when your parents tell you to eat the vegetables, they they know what they're doing? Yeah. God created us vegetarians initially. It wasn't until Genesis chapter 9 that humans were permitted to eat uh, animals. So, Plant-based diet's pretty good? Yeah, sure is. It's actually really good for you. God knew what he was doing. And as if that were not enough, God, in his incredible goodness, provides Sabbath as a gift. Look again at chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. After the narrative slows down significantly for the creation of humanity, God takes a look and sees that what he has made is very good. This is the first time he says it's very good. He says this creation is good throughout Genesis 1, and then here in day 6, he looks over all he's created and says, this is very good. And then on day 7, he does something different. God takes time to appreciate and enjoy the completion of his work. And it it emphasizes the completion of his work because you see three times in verses 2 and 3 that it it uses the phrase, God rested from all the work that he had done. All the work that he had done. All the work that he had done. It's trying to show you that God's completed it. God's resting and enjoying his completed creation. That's why one pastor writes, he has no hindrances nor incompleteness in his creative work. And the very Sabbath rest with which the narrative closes symbolizes not because God was like tired and needs a break, but his perfect accomplishment of his purposes. See, when we need a break from work, it's because work is frustrated, but that's due to Genesis chapter 3. God's work and work that God designed for humanity is good, and it shouldn't leave us exhausted. And if it does lead us exhausted, we are to rest and enjoy the good things that God provides. God gave humanity worth and purpose. Humans are to have dominion over creation, caring for it, and enjoying God and the other good things God provides. 
So our origin story clearly states that God created all things, including humanity, giving us worth and purpose. That's the main idea of this sermon, okay, just FYI. God clearly creates all things, including us, humanity, giving us worth and purpose. And so as we close, let's consider what we are to do in response to this incredible truth. First, we are to live dependently on Him. We are not self-made or self-making. Praise God. We, are, we can live dependently on Him because He provides. We belong to our Lord. And our life is, as one author notes, shaped by the God who speaks. So the message is clear for us. If we want to know how to live life in this world, then we need to be first listeners of His Word. We need to be good Bereans, checking to see what God has to say to us. Being created, formed, shaped, and guided by the word of the living and true God is the core of life in his world. We are to to depend on God. My question is, how are you doing it then? Do you seek to depend on God? Do you, or are you seeking to kind of live independently? I'm going to do things, God, I'll take care of this one, God, no problem. Or are you saying, God, I need you every day. I need you every moment. God, help me out here. How are you doing living dependently on God? Second, we are to praise Him for who He is and, uh, and for who He made us to be and for what He's provided. Uh, We are people who have worth and purpose. We are people made in His image so we reflect Him. We are people who have all good things due to His unlimited creativity and sustaining power. As long as we have breath, we have reason to praise God. That's why we take time on a Sunday morning to come together to praise God. But it shouldn't just be Sunday morning. It's like, okay, it's Sunday again. I guess i got to praise God. No, it's like every day. Every day you can wake up and be like, God, you're amazing. God, thank you. God, you made this day. We live dependently on him and we can praise God for the good things he provides. We can depend on our sovereign creator and Lord. We can praise him. And third, let me recommend this to you. Enjoy God. God made you to be in a relationship with him. Not because he needs you, Not because he's dependent on you, but because he wants to share his goodness with you. God made you to share his goodness with you. You're like, what am I here for? Well, one reason that you're here is to enjoy the goodness of God. If you're not a Christian, you can be in a relationship with God only through Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except by me. We are to trust Christ to rescue us from the problem that we have, namely sin, which enters the world through the events of Genesis 3, which we'll get to in a few weeks. But when we have a relationship with God, we can't help but enjoy Him. God is so good, the only reason that we wouldn't enjoy God is because we are blind to His goodness. That That we refuse to taste and see that the Lord is good. So friends, brothers and sisters, Take time to taste and see that the Lord is good. Enjoy God. Delight in who He is. Delight in what He's done. Delight in the good things He provides. Take time to eat highly caloric foods tonight as you watch the Super Bowl. Enjoy the good things God provides. Because let me tell you this, God is infinitely better than all we can ask or imagine. I mean, you take time to sit and think, how good is God? And it's infinitely better than what you can imagine. Enjoy God. Fourth and finally, we are to honor and obey God. He is the sovereign creator. We are not. He is the Lord and center of the whole universe. We are not. He has given us worth and purpose. We we don't give ourselves worth and purpose. We try so hard so often to be like, I have to make myself valuable in this situation. I have to prove my worth. You already have worth. 
We bear his image, representing him on this earth. So that means we are to care for creation. We are to have healthy, other-focused relationships with God and with others. We are to accept the roles and the limits that he gives us for our good and for his glory. Because the structure that he provides isn't because God's like, I want to ruin your fun. No, it's because God says, I know that this is the good limit that you should have so you can flourish within those limits. And because of that, we are to rest in him and enjoy the good things that he provides and who he is. We are to honor and obey God. How are you doing it, doing these things? Which one do you need to work on particularly most this week? I give you multiple options because maybe, maybe you can pick one. But hey, be an overachiever and do all four this week. Right? Go ahead and depend on God. Praise Him, enjoy Him, honor and obey Him. Wouldn't it be incredible if each one of us did all of these things on a daily basis? How would your life be different if it clearly showed others around you that you depend on God, that you enjoy God, that you want to praise God? Things would be different because God would be at work in and through you for His honor and glory alone. See, our origin story from Genesis 1 to chapter 2, verse 3, shows us that God created all things, including you, giving you worth and purpose. What are you going to do about it? Let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, we pray to you because you revealed who you are. We wouldn't know who you are without you speaking. Because even in your speaking, you created all things, including us. We wouldn't even exist if you had not spoken us into creation. Lord, we thank you that you do not exist simply because we think about you. We thank you that we exist because you think about us. And I pray, Lord, that our lives would be a reflection of your goodness and your glory to the world around us. That we would live with confidence, knowing that we have worth and purpose in this world that we can do the good things you've given us to do. We can live within the boundaries and limits you provided because you've done so so that each person may perhaps reach out to you and find you. And you are not far from each one of us. We can know you through your Son, Jesus Christ. We can have a relationship with you by your indwelling Spirit in our lives. Thank you for the good that you provide. Thank you for the good work you're doing in this world. Thank you that you bring order out of chaos. Thank you that you are our God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Uh, Pastor Nixon, for the message. Yeah, we do every day. It depends on God. And... We also could enjoy uh, God's presence with us. Let's all stand uh, with a response hand. Draw me close. Sometimes we are not able to because things that happen to our life, may he always enlighten us and help draw us closer to him.
Fill the world on your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. today with us. You can clap, I'm sure. Welcome. <laughs> glad that you're here today. Uh, and then uh, if you are a regular tender, also really glad that you are here because uh, we, we all need each other. Um, we live interdependently. So may you hear God's blessing um, from Numbers uh, chapter 6. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please join us as we sing the doxology to close our service. Praise God from whom all blessing flows. Praise him, O creature. Thank you for coming. Uh, you may be dismissed. Go in peace. <laughs>